So in this video, we're going to relate genetic engineering to plants, typically grown in a lab, controlled conditions. You can see growth chambers here, uh, little sterile conditions in these little uh, jars. And we're going to relate this, how we're able to change genes related to plants. I have another one on medicine where we look at vaccines. Here we're looking at food we may eat. So transgenic plants such as corn, cotton, soybeans, and many others, there's pros and cons. Uh, different ways we can genetically modify plants. One example here, and I'd provide the uh, the source, where we're looking at Roundup Ready soybean yield. So Roundup Ready means these soybeans are resistant to the herbicide Roundup that you might be familiar with. Uh, here's the control and here's the treated. So yield in bushels per acre, see our control. Again, yield is referring to how many soybeans you're getting off the field. Here's the treated, you're noticing a dramatic increase. So improved yield on Roundup Ready soybeans. So 4.3 bushel average increase per acre, average of 14 um, treatment locations across different states, um, and into Canada, a quart per acre of this Roundup, which is the active ingredient glyphosate, is the what's Roundup is basically what that is. And by having soybeans that aren't affected by Roundup, glyphosate being the herbicide, farmers are able to go through and spray the field, control the weeds, and not kill their crop. And that's what's causing the increase in yield here, seen in 2009. So conventional compared to genetically modified. Well, conventional corn, again, I found the link down here, no real benefits detected versus genetically modified corn. Uh, requires 6% less pesticides, produce enough calories to feed 88 million people per year, um, higher yield, 7.6% in this study, increased farmer income overall across all farmers from 1996 to 2007, estimated over $44 billion. So you could see here there's some um, advantages and pressures to switch over to genetically modified corn. But there are potential risks with genetically modified here abbreviated GM. The promise of genetic engineering is very much evident. However, it's generated some considerable controversy and protest. Um, are genetic engineers playing God by attempting uh, to mess with the genes? There's been rallies that say no GMOs, very much against genetic modified. Uh, whether you're for it or against it, corn production and yield per acre uh, has dramatically increased. Uh, we need to feed the world here. Uh, so that's one of the pressures too to this increasing of yield. And GM crops are one way that's showing to continue this increase. As a golden rice example, this is another form of genetically modified. It's a variety of rice that was genetically engineered to produce beta carotene, which is a precursor to vitamin A. Areas of the world where there's a shortage of vitamin A in the diet, this genetically modified rice and has this kind of golden-like color to it, is a great plant because it's widespread use over the world as a main food crop. So instead of growing this traditional rice, by simply growing this golden rice, behaves in the same way. Individuals are able to get this precursor to vitamin A, this beta carotene, it can really save a lot of people, a lot of lives, without really causing any change, just simply starting with different seeds. Uh, two common traits, though, for genetically modified, at least used on the large scale um, here across the United States, are herbicide resistance is one. And it's often referred to as Roundup Ready. In Roundup Ready corn, soybeans, alfalfa, canola, cotton, it simply means that Roundup, when applied to most plants, causes them to die. It's an herbicide. However, these genetically modified plants have this protein that's able to basically break down uh, and not suffer the effects of Roundup. So genetically modified plants are resistant to this weed killer. What this allows to occur is the plant that has that particular gene to survive and all of the regular crops and weeds and any other plants in the vicinity of that chosen crop dies, allowing the main crop to be able to survive. So the advantage to this, farmers don't have to plow the fields. It just takes a lot of input, a lot of diesel, a lot of energy, a lot of time. Dust bowl illumination. Back in the uh, turn of the century, this is actual images of topsoil that got picked up by the wind and carried these large clouds of dust. It occurred because farmers plowed their field, fields. They plowed their fields to reduce the weed pressure. Well, with herbicide resistance, they don't have to worry about that. As a result, improving yields and resulting in cleaner fields because of the lack of weeds without going through the plowing and have a risk of losing very valuable topsoil. Um, some disadvantages, though. 
herbicide resistance, like anything you use, any chemical for over a period of time, plants, animals uh, are going to develop resistance to that. It's not going to be as effective. And because only certain crops are resistant to that herbicide, the concept of monocropping occurs. You can only grow or only that one particular crop, but that one particular gene is going to survive. As a result, you're going to have a bunch of essentially potentially clones, or at least ones that are very genetically similar grown. You can't grow carrots and peas and soybeans in the same field. You can only grow genetically modified ones that are resistant to the herbicide. Uh, the idea of super weeds, move myself over to this side, super weeds, where we're applying these um, herbicides and lo and behold, resistance develops. So we grab another herbicide, different chemistry. Well, if we get resistance to that one, we apply another one, we apply another one. These super weeds may become resistant eventually to all of the herbicides that we currently have. So that's another concern, potential disadvantage that could occur. Another modification that's being um, added to plants is insect resistance, Bt. Bt inside is what it's called, Bacillus thuringiensis. What this does is it breaks down and kills caterpillars. It's a protein produced by soil bacteria and harmful to pests such as caterpillars, but not humans. It's been introduced into tomato plants and many others. Corn is another example. Here we see feeding that's occurring on a plant that did not have the gene. Here's a genetically modified one, and we see very minimal feeding that has occurred. Popular traits for herbicide resistance is one, as I mentioned, insect resistance is another, and putting them both together in the same plant is another one that's getting popularity. Herbicide tolerance we see increasing dramatically, insect resistance also, but now we're seeing the rise of the combination of the two, putting two traits into one plant. These concerns for risks uh, with these GM crops. Uh, are GM foods safe for the environment? Will other organisms be harmed unintentionally? Will pests become resistant to these pesticides? What if the introduced genes are passed from the GM crop to wild or weedy relatives? These are all concerns with these crops. Um, one of the other issues is that we have this ever-increasing world population. So we need to produce more food if we have a way of modifying crops to be able to meet that demand that will allow the population to increase. But there's also potential for other risks that may be occurring with that. Starvation would be the other flip side of that coin. So insect resistance, again, at Bacillus thuringiensis at Bt, advantages to this um, are that don't have to apply insecticides to the crop. No one wants to buy a corn that's got the, the tip basically eaten out by an insect. Reduces trips in the field. Farmers don't have to drive over all these fields, and these are very large fields in some cases. Early insects can be easily controlled. That first flush of insects can be controlled because the crop already has a built-in uh, insecticide with it. However, the cons are IPM, it's integrated pest management. That is managing the pest effectively year to year. Here we're just putting a pesticide in the field. Uh, in the plant. That's really kind of going against the whole IPM practice. Insecticide resistance, we could get insects that could be resistant, and non-target insects could also be affected. Here's resistance to different chemistries of insecticides, and we see the resistance increasing much as we saw with the herbicide resistance. Now here we have ideally if the entire field was applied and grown as with those insect resistant genes, we would see increase of developing or selecting for individuals that are resistant become very high. What farmers should be doing is allocating part of the field that simply does not have GM crops. What that does is that keeps some insects alive that are susceptible to that particular herbicide or that particular, in this case, insecticide. That allows those to be mixed in the population and increases the odds that there'll be susceptible genes in the environment through our Punnett square crosses, reducing the overall pressure. The hard part is if farmers grow a large scale and we're killing the, mass, the vast majority off, we can be selecting for this increase in insecticide resistance at a faster rate. Non-target insects, corn borers killed. Those are the ones that go into the very tips of the corn, uh, but the pollen that washes into streams may kill the non-target caddisfly. The caddisfly looks like it's present in freshwater streams, uh, eaten by a lot of trout and fish and aquatic organisms. This could be a potential non-target insect uh, from the pollen from the Bt corn 
that's targeted at corn borer could be getting into streams and could be potentially harming the caddis fly population, a non-target insect. Potential risks, are GM food safe to eat? It's a common question. Well, herbicide blocks the synthesis of aromatic amino acids, which is okay because humans don't make any aromatic amino acids. So glyphosate is not harmful to humans. However, gene modifications that render the plant resistant to glyphosate may introduce uh, novel proteins. These may, again, may have the chance to cause allergies in humans. I'll just put some examples here of some of the um, aromatic amino acids. Their full name, their three letter abbreviation, and also their single letter abbreviation. Tryptophan are probably most familiar, familiar with, especially around Thanksgiving. TRP or W are the abbreviations for that one. Should GM foods be labeled? Every serious scientific investigation has included that GM foods are safe. There's no real health risks. So the question is, well, why label something that's not harmful? However, people basically have the right to know. Uh, and we are seeing increase in labeling. More laws are being passed at the state level. So we are seeing an increase in labeling of GM crops. GMO acreage, genetically modified organism acreage worldwide, we see overall vastly increasing. On um, just, just from 1996 to 2009, even from 2009, we're seeing a continuation of this. If you're not familiar with the company uh, Monsanto, they are leading and pioneering this Roundup resistance. They developed and make um, Roundup, and they are working on increasing genetically modified food. I'll give you their website so you can take a look. What they're advocating is that by getting everyone involved and formed, we can prepare to grow enough food for a growing world. That's one that's predicted to be 9 billion people by 2050. So they're playing the side where we need to produce more food, which is true. And they see genetically modified corn and other crops as a way to supplement that. Again, people have this uh, stigma against the genetically modified crops. Again, there's no scientific studies that show there's any major negative effects. But the real question is we just simply don't know. We don't have enough years of data. And if we start growing all genetically modified crops and there's a problem that develops down the road and that's all we're growing, that can lead to potential issues also. But we have to keep in mind we have this delicate balance of this ever-increasing world population. The main question is how are we going to feed all these individuals?